Hello, today I want to talk a bit about event command transformation and also orchestration and microservices. And I do that with a um, concrete code example, so um, this should help you to get a really a grasp idea on, on the whole thing. And uh, I use an example, a business example of order fulfillment. So in, in that um, domain you could imagine something like having a shop microservice, a payment, or an inventory, and a shipping. If you're in DDD, that could be your bounded context. So it doesn't have to be a microservice, but um, nowadays it's very often a microservice. Um, these services um, do some work and then they um, emit an uh, event um, that they have done something and that event normally is put to a bus. So other components can listen to that and react. So um, we get an overall event flow if we do it like that, where we say, okay, the shop has an order placed. Um, payment listens to that, um, does the payment, then we have the payment received, inventory listens to that, then we have the good fetched, um, shipping listens to that, and we have the good ship. So that's quite often a very um, easy thing to do, and it's actually quite popular, so I saw that a lot over um, the last month. And if you do that in Java, so what I have is a very, very, very easy bus, so it's just a static list of observers and I can send events. So that's not, so you could imagine that you're doing whatever, RabbitMQ, messaging, Kafka, or whatever you have. Um, it just should show you the basics with a very simple code. So that was my idea behind that project. Um, so I have a couple of these um, uh, yeah, microservices, so my payment. So it basically just registers um, on the bus. So it gets all the events. Inventory shipping does the same, and I have a shop. And the shop can do a checkout um, for um, VIP or non-VIP customers. We get back to that in a minute. And as soon as I do that, let's do it um, only for the non-VIP customers because we don't do any, any, any differentiation anyway at the moment. So let's just um, run that. Um, now you can see that there are a couple of um, events running around. So um, first of all, from the shop, I get the order place event. Um, then payment basically um, picks it up because it says, oh, there's an event um, which is order placed, which is interesting for me. Um, so I retweet the payment. And this is um, basically doing nothing but just sends the next event. Oh, I have the payment received. And the same thing goes for um, the inventory, which fetches the goods, uh, and the shipping, which ships them. So that's a very easy way actually to uh, to implement the overall system. So you only have event flows, you don't have any, any central orchestrator or whatever. Um, that's why it's very, very famous actually nowadays. If you now want to want to change the overall flow, and this is where it starts to get very interesting. So let's assume um, we go back and we assume that we have VIP or non-VIP customers. So you could do something like if you um, sell to public organizations, they get an invoice or everybody else must pay in advance or something like that. So that's a bit of a requ business requirement, which is not hard to imagine. So um, what I want to do is for the VIP customers, um, which is just in my payload, it's just a VIP flag. Um, I don't want to do a payment now. So how can I implement that in this architecture? And that's interesting because then um, if I look at the overall um, event flow, it basically means that payment now has to decide if it does the payment, but it also means that for inventory, it might not get a payment received, but it, the order it has to rest on the order place. So I have to actually change two places here. Um, the first is I have to go to payment, and I say, um, okay, order place is not enough. I might, um, I actually have prepared the code um, to not code the whole time here. But um, I have to say, if it's order placed and it's not a VIP customer, then I do the payment. But I also have to change um, the inventory um, because it might not get a payment received. But it either gets a payment received if it's not a VIP customer um, or it gets the order placed for VIP customers, if that's true. Okay, so I have to change these two things. Um, now I can run it again. And it should actually work. So um, for, 
for non-VIP, it does the payment, creates a bad ship. For VIP, it doesn't do the payment. So um, actually, it was I was able to implement it. But um, what I don't really like about that um, implementation, I had to change actually two places. And if you're going with microservices, it means that now two teams have to coordinate the efforts. Um, they have to deploy maybe at the same time. That's exactly what you don't want to have in your microservice environment. So you tie them together. Um, I like these uh, these pictures of three-leg race where you're bound together with somebody else and run together. Um, that it's just slower overall. So you really tie together two teams here. And you teach um, the payment context something it should not know about VIP customers. The payment should not care about VIP customers. And um, the inventory shouldn't care either. So now you spread around data um, which you really don't need in these kind of components. Why should the inventory know about VIP? Okay, so that's, for, for me, that's not an optimal solution. Um, what you can do to improve that is what we call an event um, command transformation. Um, so whenever you have the order placed, you, have, you need a component which transform that event into a command because um, in this case, we don't want to want to couple the payment to the order place, but we want to say we have something which knows about payment and knows whenever I have an order placed, I have to retrieve the payment. And that's now a command which is really targeting at the payment. And that's a very different thing than, than an event. So it's not that payment can, can choose to um, listen to it or not. It's something it has to obey. So whenever I get the command, the payment has to do it. And that means, in my case, it's, it would be very um, uh, handy to, um, to introduce something like an order um, as an own concept, as an own maybe unbounded context, as an own microservice, which basically keeps track of the overall flow. Um, it could do something like, um, whenever the order is placed, I send the retrieve payment command. When I get the payment received, I send the fetch goods command. And if the goods is fetched, I send, send the ship's good command. So that basically just um, keeps track of this overall flow. And um, let's quickly do that. So um, I have to basically to change um, inventory again, because inventory doesn't listen to the payment received anymore, because it doesn't know about that. But it now listens to the um, command. Okay. The same goes for, for payment. The payment now um, just listens to the um, retrieve payment command. And the same goes for shipping. Shipping also changes because shipping um, now also listens to a command. Um, the only thing I have to change is I have also um, to initialize the order to listen to the bus and be able to um, emit the uh, commands. As soon as I do that, I can do the same thing again, I can run it, so um, I get the order placed event, then I get the retrieve payment command, the payment received event, the fetch goods command, the goods fetched event, the ship goods command, the goods shipped. So that works pretty well, and for um, the VIP case, I haven't yet um, implemented that, but um, now in the order, um, I could do something like order place and now I have to do the differentiation if it's VIP or not. So this is something uh, which I can now implement in exactly one place. And that's one of the um, big differences here. And for this um, for this business example, so it, it, it might not be always the case that you need a command, um, but in some cases it makes very much sense to, um, to issue these kind of commands and use an event command transformation. And for me, for this business example, this is much more logical to have an order um, context and um, also to issue a couple of these commands. Um, it's basically because of all the change scenarios. So if you look at the system, if you want to change something later on, um, in this case, you have to touch multiple points. You have to touch um, services you don't want to touch. You tie deployment times together and all these kind of things. So that's not a route you want to go down um, with microservices. It's um, and you, yeah, and you can basically um, um, draw a lot of these kind of change scenarios, which are um, really not easy to, to do here. So that's why I, I would introduce that. 
um, order context here um, with these event commands once for me. Um, so far, so good. There is one additional thing I want to quickly show that. So as soon as you have the event command transformation and you have the order context, um, you have a place where um, where you basically take care about all the um, order things, so what happens in, in, in a row, the event flow, and these kind of things. Um, now you could imagine something like um, the inventory, for example. The inventory... Um, I mean, it's, it's reality, so the inventory says, oh, sorry, I'm out of stock. There should be something, yeah, I thought I can deliver it, but it's not there. And it, I mean, that's now internal of the inventory, so as an, uh, as an owner for, from, for the order microservice, you don't know about it. But um, it might be very well a decision in the inventory that you have to, you, you bought whatever, it takes some time to find it, or you relocate something from a different stock, or whatever. So it might be that you get some uh, message back later on. So for the moment, I just send any, any, anything back. And as soon as you have these kind of things, um, you start immediately in the order um, thinking about state. So what people start doing is something like have an order entity, and then in the order entity, they, they basically code something like, um, Let's do it like, like I have an order entity and there I could have something like an ID maybe. Uh, sorry. Um, and then something like um, private patch, for example, uh, paid, sorry. Um, the same thing maybe for fetched and so on and so on. So um, you start to add state to that entity in order to keep track of that state. So you might even um, add not a boolean but a date. That's what usually happens because then um, you want to want to do something like, oh, this is paid for more than three um, days but not yet delivered. There's something wrong about it. So you want to have monitoring in that. And this is actually what I see a lot out there. And then you start implementing a lot of features, um, typical orchestration of virtual engines already have. Um, so as soon as you go that route, it makes very much sense maybe to, um, to think about an alternative. And I want to quickly show you um, some today. So I have an alternative implementation of that order flow. And in this case, I use Camunda, which is, might not be that surprising um, for you because I'm also co-founder of Camunda, so I'm quite into that. Um, but I think it makes very much sense. So what do I do here? Um, the, the cool thing about the Kamunda engine is that it can run it completely in memory, that it can run it in flight, in process. It's a very lightweight engine. So if I'm in Java, I can just do something like um, standalone in memory process engine configuration build process engine. There it is. So there's not much to do. I mean, in memory doesn't make sense in a real life system. So normally you just connect it to a database. Um, as soon as I do that, I can defly, uh, define the flow um, of the events I, I hard coded earlier. And let's have a quick look at that. So there are two ways of defining flows in Kamunda. Um, we're currently working on a third way, but the current two ways are either you define it in code. So you could do something like, okay, the first thing is I retrieve the payment and then I wait for the payment received message. Then I um, issue the fetch goods command and wait for the good fetch. So you see that's very readable and um, in order to say, how do I retrieve the payment? I just attach some um, very simple Java code, um, which is executed whenever um, this is done. And then this sends the retrieve payment command. Okay, so that's kind of very straightforward to do. Um, and then, let's quickly go down there. And then whenever I receive a payment, uh, I receive an event, which is order placed. I start a new instance of that flow. I hand in the data, so this is persisted as well, like the order ID. And then I correlate the um, res um, I mean, yeah, the incoming events, like payment received or goods fetch. I just correlate to the waiting instance, in this case by order ID. It could be any kind of ID. And you see that's quite easy to do. So um, this could even be more generic. I just hard-coded it here to keep it very simple. So that's also kind of... Um, um, easy code. And so far you might think, okay, but where's, where's the big benefit? 
And the big benefit starts to um, pay off as soon as you uh, make the flow more complex, as soon as you um, tackle these requirements I mentioned earlier. Like, um, you might want to have a VIP payment. So um, you can do something like it's called an exclusive gateway. So you go either the one way or um, the other way. So um, depending on, and this is an expression language, um, which um, just inspects the payload, the variables. So that's a Boolean variable. So I can just write something like, if not VIP, then I do the retrieve payment. That's the first thing. The next thing I did is, um, I implemented something for um, that wait for goods. So I wait for the events that the goods are fetched. If that is not happening, I um, just attach a, a timer. So in this case for the demo, it's two seconds. It's not very realistic, but it's two seconds here. And whenever this timer priors, I say I, I do something, which is basically sending a cancel event. And then um, I do, um, that's pretty cool if you know the saga pattern or, or business transactions or um, compensation, and that's built in. So you can do something like compensate everything which was done so far, because I don't get the goods, so I want to compensate. And I defined, um, for example, within the um, retrieve payment, I, I defined that whenever I retrieve the payment, I do a compensation, and that is refund the payment which sends a new um, event or, or basically a command to the um, payment microservice and so on and so on. So you see it's, it's, it's quite easy to define this kind of things and you get all these, these kind of state handling, timeout handling, the compensation handling, a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, and as soon as I have that flow, I deploy it to the engine and I basically, and that's something I want to show you in a minute, I also write it to a file. Um, let's delete that and rewrite it. Um, so we can see that graphically because that's quite of a cool thing. Um, but let's see that in a minute. Uh, we have we connected it, so yeah, so we can just run it again. And um, it now starts up the engine. It should already have written the file actually. Where is it? There it is. And um, that's a cool thing. So in the background, we are creating a so-called BPMN process here. Um, BPMN is a standard, an ISO standard, so it's quite common in the, um, in the workflow world. And uh, you can also look at it um, graphically. And there you can see, like, um, now it gets really um, um, visible. So you see, oh, okay, I, I, I do that differentiation between normal folks and VIP. Um, and for example, here, I wait for the um, goods. I only given it IDs, I haven't um, given it any readable names. I could do that in the code as well. If I want to use a graphic, I should maybe. And, and there I attach the timer. Whenever this timer fires, I go this way. Um, this is the compensation. So this triggers the compensation. And that's pretty cool because the engine internally keeps track of activities which are executed correctly or, or which finished execution correctly. And, and that means the um, payment refund is only done if I walk through the payment, retrieve payment correctly. So if I, for VIP customers, um, I don't do a refund, which I don't have to specify again here. So that's kind of um, very easy to do. And you see it's very, very lightweight. It just starts in memory. And so you see for no VIP, I do the order place, the retrieve payment, the payment received, the fetch goods. Goods cannot be fetched. Um, now um, we have that two seconds of waiting, which means um, I have to go down a bit here. Here comes the order cancel event. And for this order ID, the refund payment command. For VIP customers, fetch goods doesn't work. And that's the 5C1. So that gets an order cancel, but never have a refund payment command. Okay. So um, that was basically it. Okay, my idea was to walk you through it and, and to use concrete, very easy code in order to show these concepts, but to make them more and more yeah, tangible. I hope that was helpful. Um, see you sometime again. Bye-bye.